I'm going to be uh, talking about the theme of AI and I'm going to try and theorize AI or try and think about what theoretical insights we can get from AI. In many ways, my interest in AI is not necessarily about AI itself, but about what it might say about human intelligence. Um, and that's really going to be the theme of what I'm going to talk about. What can we learn about human intelligence um, from studying AI itself? Um, so what, what I would say is interesting about this is, is my background was a bit similar to, to in some ways to Sanford's in the sense I, I, I was trained as an architect, but then I studied what we call in England uh, critical theory. Um, books like Rethinking Architecture and Camouflage and the Anesthetic of Architecture came out of that. Um, but then I shifted increasingly into the world of computational design uh, after teaching at places like uh, Columbia under Bernard Schumi and then the AA and so on. And uh, I've been trying to theorize the dig digital, which is not an easy task uh, for many reasons. I mean, many aspects of the dig digital you can't really theorize. A robotic arm just does what a robotic arm does. Um, uh, in fact, the world of technology itself is quite difficult to theorize in the, the theory and science and technology is largely kind of explanation rather than the kind of theory that we understand in architecture. Um, however, uh, one thing I'd say about AI is it opens up all sorts of possibilities, um, not least because you're forced to address the question of consciousness. Um, a kind of deep, deeply problematic and difficult philosophical, philosophical question. Um, but it also, to my mind, as I want to try and demonstrate today, really opens up questions about how we can understand um, uh, architectural theory and what it is to be an architect. Um, so, uh, let me just play briefly um, a, a short um, video of the kind of work that I want to talk about. Uh, AI has become like almost like a virus in architecture. Um, it's really taken over many schools of architecture um, and uh, has become really the, the in thing. Um, and uh, so let me just quickly show you the kind of work that is coming out um, from schools of architecture. This is, this is a work by Daniel Bolojan, where he's using cycle GANs to pair up two unpaired data sets, um, uh, one based on the Sagrada Familia and one a video of walking through the forest. Um, so this is what you get. Okay, um, I should say that Wolf Pricks will be talking about this particular work or, or the work of Daniel Bolojan um, in a discussion with Tom Main um, during the course of this week. Um, and Tom Main and Wolf Pricks are two examples of architects really taken by um, what AI can offer. Um, it's also pervasive um, in places like SIARC and certainly at my university, FIU, we've been working with Daniel Bolojan and, and uh, working on, on GANs. Um, I'll explain what, what that's all about later on, but first of all, I want to show you something that really, I think, shocked me into recognizing the potential of AI. Um, this is uh, LAX, Los, Ange Los Angeles International Airport, and this is me boarding a plane, a flight to Shanghai, an American Airlines flight to Shanghai. And you know how it is when you go board a plane normally, you can have a boarding pass, or these days you can use, you can download your boarding pass onto your, onto your phone and scan it and so on. And that's the standard procedure. Um, when I boarded this plane, they were testing out a new um, facial recognition service. And they said to me, I came along with my boarding pass and they said, don't worry about that, just look at the screen. So I walked forward to the screen, please approach the camera. And all of a sudden it recognized who I was. Um, at that moment, I was both astonished and terrified. I was astonished because it had recognized my face from everybody else in the world. And I was terrified for exactly the same reason. Um, and I think this is the kind of the issue about AI that everybody is trying to grasp, how it is both amazing and terrifying 
at the same time. Um, and if there's one person who maybe sums up this position, it's Elon Musk. Elon Musk uses AI extensively in his work. Um, the uh, uh, Tesla cars uh, employ AI, SpaceX employs AI, and so on and so on. He's very, very familiar with AI. But he's also terrified about the potential of AI because it, 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 if it gets out of hand in the wrong hands, uh, it could be terrifying. And, and maybe one of the things he was involved in um, was a, uh, what was a project called OpenAI. And um, he at one point withdrew his funding from AI, OpenAI because he realized how terrifyingly uh, successful it was. So here's an example of what happened. Um, they inputted the first line of George Orwell's 1984. It was a bright cold day in April and the clocks were striking at 13. And they let the AI generate some text based on that. Obviously, there's something kind of weird about the clock striking, striking 13. But then this kind of story unfolds um, that actually reads quite well. Um, at some point, it's nonsensical. But nonetheless, this is a kind of narrative that has been generated automatically by the computer. Um, and, and something, I think, which is astonishing. I was on, in my car on, the, my, way, on the, my way to a, a new job in Seattle. I put the gas in, put the key in, and then I let it run. I just imagine what the day would be like. A hundred years from now, in 2045, I was a teacher in some school in a poor part of rural China. I started with Chinese history and history of science. Um, and I guess I kind of feel I share that um, position. Um, uh, in a sense, I, uh, I, I, I'm both terrified by and uh, amazed by AI. Um, so on the one hand, there's a positive side of AI. Um, this is Alan Turing, um, and in the background, the bomb, the kind of proto-computer that he uses, used to decode the, um, uh, the, the, the Nazi Enigma um, uh, secret code. Um, and Turing has been, is, is recognized by many people as the person who first started talking about the computer, and he was uh, the, seemingly the first person to start, start talking about AI. Um, this quote of his that was published in the Times um, and now appears on the 50 pound note. Um, this is only a foretaste of what is to come and a shadow of what is to be, in fact, relates to the world of computation in general, um, but it might as well be used to relate to, uh, to AI. Um, the irony about, about uh, Alan Turing um, was that everybody knows about him partly because of the movie, The Imitation Game, that came out recently, and partly because he's now acknowledged um, and on the front of a, of a, pound, a 50 pound note. But at the time when he was working, everything he was doing was official secret. Um, nothing was released until the 1970s, so nobody knew that what he had achieved during the war. Um, and during the war, he had, he had well, according to, to, to the, the range of different estimates as how many lives he was responsible for saving, um, some people, uh, the lo lowest range is 2 million and it goes up to 18 million. Um, but for sure, he successfully brought the war to, to the end. I, I was brought up in the UK and uh, my favorite program when I was a kid was Doctor Who. Um, now, Doctor Who is an interesting kind of person in many ways because unlike American superheroes who kind of get into fights and slug it out, uh, Alan Turing, Dr. Alan Turing, uses science and technology to save the world each week. Um, and in many ways, I kind of think of Dr. Alan Turing as the original version of Doctor Who. But when he died, um, he committed suicide in 1954, I think it was, um, uh, uh, nobody knew who, what he'd done or what, uh, who he was. Um, in fact, what happened was that uh, he, um, apart from talking about AI for the first time and, and talking about uh, the, uh, the possibility of computation, um, uh, he also was famous for establishing the so-called Turing test, whereby you could test whether AI was successful or not uh, as to whether you, you thought it was a human being or not. Um, it was based on an English parlor game called The Imitation Game. The tragedy of Alan Turing was that uh, he was gay in a society that was um, uh, deeply heterosexual and a society in which to be gay was a criminal offense. And he was, in the end, convicted 
of um, of being gay, and, and uh, he was given the choice of going to prison or taking some form of chemical castration. He opted for the latter, but sub but subsequent to that, uh, he committed suicide. We think um, partly, no doubt, as a result of this very um, public humiliation that he had to go through. In effect, he had failed his own imitation game and he failed to pass himself off as being heterosexual in a, a society in which homosexuality was, was banned. Anyway, he died without before people knew exactly what he'd done, but he in many ways sort of uh, um, uh, epitomizes the kind of optimism about the potential of what AI could do. And this quote, I think, sums it all up. On the other hand, um, there have been a history of events that I will talk about them more later, where AI has seemingly um, taken over in a terrifying way. This is Gary Kasparov with his uh, head in his hands uh, when he was beaten by um, Deep Blue, the IBM computer in 1997, the first time that the world chess champion had been defeated by a computer. Nobody thought it was possible. Indeed, Kasparov himself thought the computer cheated. Um, uh, and and he, made this, he makes this comment, we just have to understand that everything that we know how to do, machines will eventually do better than us. Um, and that's because they can learn and they can learn incredibly quickly. Um, actually, Kasparov tries to reprieve this moment as being a success for human beings because it was human beings who developed the AI. But on the whole, we can see that there's a kind of a, a continuing story in which human beings are continually humiliated, as it were, at the hands of AI. So we get to a kind of a very positive view of AI and a very negative view of AI. Um, I'm currently in the process, I've just finished one manuscript on AI. Um, it's a, a book that's about the positive side of AI. Um, uh, it has a white cover, like an angel, and it's about to be published by Bloomsbury. I'm not sure the title just yet, we're still debating that. A revolution in architectural design is actually what's happening. Uh, I think that's the right, correct term. Uh, I was contemplating though, whether we could have a, uh, my students wanted me to have the title, Alexa, design my building, because that is what it will be able to do very soon. Co totally autonomously, autonomously, it will be able to design buildings. Um, I, this is volume one and volume two is gonna have a black cover and it's about the negative side of AI. Um, and the title of this one is definitely gonna be the death of the architect um, and for an obvious reason. If you get to a situation whereby you say, Alexa, design my building, that effectively is the end of the architect, the death of the architect. So in a sense, we're looking at two sides of the same coin, the same AI that is both terrifying and also amazing. So today I want to um, talk about, um, uh, by way of introduction, um, talk through the lens of, uh, uh, of the, the movie, um, Blade Runner. At least I'll introduce it by talking about Blade Runner. Come with one um, of the discord. Sorry, could you try and move this? <laughs> um, uh, and so the title of today's talk is uh, Do Robots Dream of Digital Sheep? And I'm here referring here to Blade Runner, the original Blade Runner that was launched, um, uh, Ridley Scott's Blade Runner that was, that was uh, uh, released in 1982, but which actually took place in 2019. And it was based, of course, on the, the novel by uh, Philip K. Dick, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? Now, I'm based in Los Angeles, and this was a meme that was going around uh, at the turn of last year, how one day Los Angeles was Los Angeles, and then the next day it was a scene from Blade Runner. Um, so, uh, and literally, uh, 2019 was when it was set. Uh, in fact, it was set uh, on, on, on uh, if you look, if you follow the clues in um, the second Blade Runner movie, Blade Runner 2049, it was set between the 19th of November and the 21st of November, 2019. So the story of uh, Blade Runner, as you probably know, is a story of um, two individuals who are, um, oh, sorry, six, six replicants um, who, um, come back to earth with a view to trying to get their life extended. The story of replicants are that they are super uh, powerful, super intelligent, um, uh, biologically um, uh, generated uh, artificial beings, um, bioengineered artificial beings um, that are manufactured to work in the off-world colonies. Um, they're there and they need to be 
tougher, more resilient, um, to survive in those, 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 uh, in that situation, those circumstances. And in the case of the more um, refined models, Nexus 7, um, uh, as we can see, uh, um, Roy Batty on the right hand side, this is Prissy and Roy Batty. Uh, Roy Batty was, was, is the leader of the replicants and uh, he's a, a Nexus 7, a, a super smart um, uh, replicant. Anyway, they come down to Earth to, to they, they have a mutiny, they come down to Earth and they're trying to find out how to, um, how to extend their lives because they're given as a kind of safety measure a four year life extension, a, a lifespan. Um, and the story basically is, is of this, of these replicants who infiltrate society because they look almost identical to human beings, almost identical to human beings. Um, and the only way that you can tell the difference between a human being and a replicant is by going through an elaborate test, the voigt kampf test, which, which tested, uh, tests out so the, the, the uh, individual is given certain um, questions to test out their empathy and their reflex, their eye reflex is also being, being checked. Um, and uh, that's the only way you can tell really a replicant. Um, but what is interesting about this is, and here we see um, Roy Batty playing chess against Eldon, Eldon Tyrell, the, the guy who, um, uh, who, whose company uh, manufactured him, is of course that they are potentially smarter than human beings. And here is Roy Batty playing chess against Eldon, Eldon Tyrell and uh, Roy Batty wins, um, but eventually kills Eldon Tyrell. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> So here's Rachel. Um, the one bit of the film they clearly got wrong was they didn't predict that uh, people wouldn't be smoking by 2019. Uh, but Rachel, as we find out, um, uh, uh, has a baby with um, the Blade Runner, um, played by Harrison Ford, uh, who uh, is out there to try and who is commissioned to um, retire, which means to kill these replicants because they are so dangerous. Um, uh, Harrison Ford plays a, um, let's say, a kind of bounty hunter, sort of former policeman who goes out trying to, to retire these ones. But if, uh, he ends up um, having an affair with Rachel. And the, 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 sort of the, 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 the question that's left hanging in a very beautiful way in the movie itself um, is whether Harrison Ford is himself a replicant. Um, and we find out in 2049 that indeed, the, 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 the follow-up movie, that indeed he is a replicant. Um, so here he is at the final moment um, uh, in this famous soliloquy um, where he's, um, uh, uh, he is saved at the last moment by um, the fact that, that Roy Batty dies before he can, um, can kill him, um, can kill Harrison Ford. In fact, he saves him at the last moment in an interesting kind of paradox. So it's worth thinking, looking back on this, what's, whether in fact this prediction of the future was so accurate. Um, clearly we don't have flying cars, but we do have drones, we have maglev trains. Um, we don't have the Tyrell Corporation, but we have corporate life is dominated by tech companies, Amazon, uh, Google, uh, Apple, Microsoft, and so on. Um, and, and we, if anything, if you're gonna look at uh, uh, this sort of scene, we have, um, advertising on buildings in places like Shanghai that are even more kind of extreme than, than, um, than, than was depicted in Blade Runner. In many ways, Blade Runner was actually quite an interesting um, uh, uh, commentary on the future. And there is a further parallel there going on. Um, and I don't know whether you know this because everybody's been talking about Contagion as being the movie that predicted what we're going through now in the pandemic. But actually, if you think about Blade Runner, um, what is interesting is the first day, the, fir the, the first time that coronavirus was detected, COVID-19 was detected, was the 17th of November, 2019, two days before um, uh, Blade Runner was set. And interestingly, of course, um, coronavirus, COVID-19, is also invisible. Um, it's kind of working its way through society and we can't tell it except by conducting an elaborate test. And it's also kind of lethal, like the like um, the replicants themselves. So there's an interesting kind of uh, theme going on um, where you can comp compare the two. And of course, this was not the, the fact that it was um, set in, in on the 19th of November um, or 19th to 21st of November 2019 was not lost on Elon Musk. 
This is a cyber truck that was launched on the 21st of November 2019 and modeled on um, the, the cars in Blade Runner and also the car in Blade Runner 2049. Um, so artificial intelligence. Um, the first thing I'd say about artificial intelligence is when you're thinking about artificial intelligence, don't think about humanoid robots. Don't think about Sophia. Um, AI is everywhere, but it's like the replicants, it's, uh, or like the coronavirus, it is invisible. We can't see its operations. When you think of AI, think of algorithms. But you see AI, AI is an operation everywhere. It's, it's filtering out your spam on your emails. It's uh, identifying your friends on Facebook. It is recognizing images on Instagram. It is already, always already in the environment, um, even though we might not have to aware of it. Now, AI itself is a slightly confusing term because it's an umbrella term that was, eventually, was initially coined in the 1950s and is still used today to describe the different forms of AI. Um, but in fact, there are many different forms of AI. And within uh, the best way to think about it, these kind of these Russian dolls where one is contained within the other, there is the broader category of AI, which has absolutely changed and shifted from what it was when, we, when it was first invented to something way more sophisticated now. Um, think of the first cars and compare them to say Elon Musk's um, Tesla at the moment. Um, it's developed in an astonishing, uh, it's, it's developed in a completely different, uh, completely different dimension. Within AI itself, then you get machine learning, where the computer has started to, to learn things. And then within machine learning, you get this other category, which is really what people refer to most of the time these days when they're talking about AI, and that is deep learning. And deep learning is the most sophisticated form of, of, of AI, and it's, it's astonishingly powerful. It's made possible by, of course, by a number of recent um, advances, uh, uh, the uh, development of cloud computing, the um, enormously powerful computers we have today, the much better algorithms we're using, the intense competition that's going on around the world, uh, and the interest, uh, the number of kind of students who are now studying computer science. These factors have meant that we're now in a world where you can hardly compare these two. But with, in order to understand AI, you've got to make a series of distinctions. The first distinction I want to make is a distinction between human intelligence or natural intelligence and AI. Um, AI does not possess consciousness. This is something I will address more in my next talk. Um, in other words, it's not aware of what it's doing. Um, the term that's used for AI uh, that is aware of what it's doing, that AI with consciousness, is, is AGI, Artificial General in uh, Intelligence, and we don't have anything like that yet. Um, uh, there's what we see uh, uh, well, of AGI is only in the movies, um, or maybe things like uh, Sophia, the, the, the humanoid robot, which are kind of shams because they don't really have consciousness that they're presenting themselves as being that. We are a long way yet from having um, uh, uh, AI with consciousness. So within that, you, the, you have the general category, you've got machine learning and, and deep learning. Um, the, the point about all this is, this is that everything obeys uh, Moore's law in technology, um, or as Ray Kurzweil now, uh, the term that Ray Kurzweil now uses, the, the law of accelerating returns, meaning that we have exponential growth. Exponential growth in terms of computing power and the cost is coming down at the same time. Exponential growth reminds you of how the pandemic has been spreading. Um, if one person uh, uh, infects two other people and those two other people infect four other people and those four other people infect uh, eight other people, you get one, two, four, eight, sixteen, which is very different from one, two, three, four. Exponential growth is where it kind of speeds up. And we're in that situation where technology is speeding up. And uh, for that reason, it's, it's, uh, the, the future will be, on, be, be upon us um, fairly soon. Um, so uh, there are, within uh, deep learning, there are three types of learning, supervised learning, uh, unsupervised learning, and reinforcement learning. And these are kind of similar in some ways to how um, human beings are taught. This is, um, sorry, this is, I mean, I should have mentioned this before. This is a, a, the, the, the distinction between, um, um, between neurons in the brain and neural networks in AI. Um, and uh, the important thing is that, that, that with connectionism, the, now the most successful form of deep learning, which is modeled on the brain, um, 
it, it, they use the term neurons, but they're nowhere near as sophisticated as human neurons. In fact, Melanie Mitchell, who writes about this thing, about this subject very authoritatively, refers to them as units rather than neurons because they are so different from neurons in the brain. At the same time, what I'm going to try and bring out today is the fact that actually um, uh, you can understand something about the, how the human brain operates, but about human neurons through thinking about AI. Um, so the, so uh, supervised learning is when you basically teach a computer to do something. Um, you uh, give it samples, and, uh, let's say in this case, nails. And it, it, what's interesting here, this is a, a Google search um, for a nail, one of my students did. Um, he was working on, he spent the entire semester uh, uh, getting the, training the computer to recognize a nail, um, a, a, a fixing that is for architecture. And here you, he Googles the word nail and it gives him two samples of, of, of the architectural nail and it, it gives it 90%, 99% um, uh, predi uh, kind of, uh, it's 99% sure that it's a nail. It's never 100% sure, but it's 99.9% .9 or something sure. Uh, so here you've trained a computer to recognize a nail. And in many ways, that's very similar to the way how people, how children, how kids are taught. You think of a mother teaching a kid to recognize a cow or a donkey or a horse or a, a, a snake or whatever. Um, it's that process. So supervised learning, we also have that with human beings. Also in architecture, we are taught in a very didactic way what is a triglyph, what is a metope, what is a, what is entesis and so on in terms of classical architecture, we are taught to kind of know what these things mean. But alongside that, we also have, um, we also have a, a kind of unsupervised learning. And this is the kind of way that we pick up languages. Um, unsupervised learning is the most remarkable part of AI in many ways, um, because you don't have to train it anything. It begins to form clusters and to understand things in a certain way. And that also is kind of similar to how human beings operate. Not only do we pick up languages that way, but also I think within architectural culture, we, um, we pick up what it is to be an architect, both at schools and architecture and also um, working in an architectural office. And finally, there's, um, there is a, a reinforcement learning, which is whereby you give rewards. Um, now that's how, for example, AlphaGo was trained. Um, and what is interesting is, is the speed at which the kind of reinforcement training happens. I forget the exact um, uh, figures, but something like, a, 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 I think AlphaGo was trained 4 million times over a space of, of, of a very short period of, of several days. In other words, computational speed in terms of reinforcement learning is something astonishing. And of course, reinforcement learning is again what we have um, in, in, in human culture, um, in architectural culture. You, 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 get rewarded for being top of your class, you get rewarded for, for winning, the, you know, for being a good architect by winning the Prisca Prize, for winning competitions and so on. So in many ways, these are the kind of forms that, um, that human beings, uh, forms of, of learning that human beings also engage with. Now, throughout the history of AI, which is again, in many ways, a totally invisible um, history because you don't see AI, you don't know about it. Um, there've been certain key moments when AI, the achievements of, of, of AI have been brought to public consciousness, um, largely as kind of promotional exercises on the part of, of the companies involved, in this case, IBM. This is Gary Kasparov uh, walking confidently into his match against Deep Blue, a match that, as I mentioned, um, he lost. Um, but there are other moments. Um, this was um, Jeopardy, when IBM Watson um, followed up that earlier triumph. Um, and here he is completely trouncing the best human Jeopardy players. Um, what I like actually is a, is a comment on the left-hand side. Um, I, for one, welcome our, um, our, uh, our new computer overlord, which is a kind of tongue-in-cheek reference to the Simpson, um, Simpsons. But anyway, um, this was a moment with a, a quiz game, which is way more difficult than, than just simple chess. Um, but uh, when, when I think human beings realized that this was a kind of terrifyingly powerful new tool. But to my mind, the most important event was this match that was played by, by, uh, between AlphaGo, which is a, um, now belongs to Google, but it's based in London, um, a, a deep learning um, uh, um, company. Um, and they took on not the world champion at, at Go, but one of the top players in the world, Lee Sedol. Um, and this was 2016. And this was a, a momentous moment for many reasons. I mean, first of all, uh, there was a moment, which a very famous moment now in game two, 
move 37. When AlphaGo played this move that uh, the experts could not understand, it seemed to be a mistake. In fact, to begin with, Lisa Doll apparently smiled. He thought it was a mistake. But then he realized the sheer uh, ingenuity of this particular move and the smile drained from his face. Um, this move had never been played before. Um, it was one of the most astonishing moves ever made. And eventually, of course, it led to um, Lisa Doll being beaten. What fascinated the commentators on Go were the, what they called these slack moves. In other words, moves that they could not see or, uh, the relevance of at the time, but realized eventually the complete brilliance of this. And this is, I guess, in some senses, what we're going to face soon is that we're not even going to be aware about how intelligence, artificial intelligence is. Um, anyway, uh, Move 37 has become famous because of this. Um, and I guess the question has been speculated about as to whether, whether computers can be creative. And certainly Fan Hui, who was a, um, the European Go champion who was there to commentate on the match, uh, he was kind of convinced that, um, that this was a sign of creativity. Others such as Melanie Mitchell think that in order to be creative, you really got to be aware of what you've done. You've got to be, you've got to know that you, you've been creative. And therefore she thinks that the computer cannot be creative. But I think it's opened up a whole series of kind of questions about what the computer can do. Um, this is a, a shot from the um, More Than Human exhibition on AI that was at the Barbican a couple of years ago. Here's Lisa Doll saying, yesterday I was surprised, but today I am speechless. Um, and what was also interesting about that particular moment, um, um, in many ways, the, all these moments are not necessarily so advanced computation, but the fact they're there in the public imagination um, is why they were so powerful. And of course, what happened in, in, um, in, in China when they saw this? I mean, to the West, a game of Go, not many of us play Go, it does, it's fairly sort of meaningless, but there were millions and millions of people watching this match in China. And all of a sudden, that's their kind of national game. And it's an incredibly complex game. There are more moves in Go than there are atoms in the universe. And all of a sudden they realize, holy shit, this is a bit not my moment boarding this plane. This was the, the moment of awakening. Um, Kai-Fu Lee has written about this in his book, AI Superpowers, where he's contrasting Shenzhen to Silicon Valley. Um, he talks about this as a Sputnik moment. The Sputnik moment was when the American, um, uh, Americans woke, woke, woke up to the fact that the Russians were beating them at the space race. And I think you can see the space race really as a continuation as part of the Cold War. And they realized they had to do something about it. So, the, so um, with, with Sputnik, they created NASA. Um, and this was the Sputnik moment for China because all of a sudden the Chinese realized they had to get invest, they had to invest in AI. And uh, President Xi gave a speech not long afterwards, dedicating, um, saying that, that, that how committed China was to developing AI. Um, as I have a have a, a post over the summer in, in in China in Shanghai, I'm very much aware of this. In China, they're obsessed by AI, absolutely obsessed by AI, and they're extremely good at AI. Um, uh, Kai Fu Li thinks that, that Silicon Valley is going, is that, uh, uh, that Shenzhen is going to overtake S uh, Silicon Valley. Um, uh, and I could imagine that that could well be possible. So the question though that I want to address today um, is whether AI can be creative. Um, and of course that is a deeply philosophical question. So I'm not necessarily going to address the full question, but I just want to look at the kind of ways that it can operate um, uh, that seem to be, to produce kind of results that seem to be creative. Now, let me just kind of, most people from Ada Lovelace onwards kind of believe that AI can't be truly creative. Um, the general opinion um, is summed up by Makoto Sei Watanabe, um, a Japanese computational expert who makes the comment, but people are the only ones who can create an image that does not yet exist. Machines do not have dreams. Well, the first part of that is clearly untrue. We've already seen a kind of hallucination um, of a combination of, of the Sagrada Familia and the uh, walk through a forest. Um, uh, and clearly it can produce novel outcomes or outcomes that are, um, have never been seen before. Machines, but machines do not have dreams is a much more interesting kind of uh, uh, issue to address. So I wanna kind of uh, talk uh, about the theme of hallucinating and dreaming. Um, 
and show the kind of work that's been coming out relatively recently. This is very, very recent. We're talking about in the last you know, six, seven years um, uh, that has really transformed the, 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 the domain of AI um, because we now have computers doing something that is completely different to what it would, they were doing before. I mentioned on your iPhone, it's recognizing um, your friends on, on, on Facebook and, and, and images on Instagram. That is what AI has been famous for at recognizing a, a certain images. What hallucinating and dreaming is, um, and it's called in the industry, it's called synthesis, is when you will go the opposite direction. When you start, you, you might take, for example, a, 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 a cow or something, and, and, or the word cow, rather than recognizing a cow, um, as happened before, you take the word cow and you would hallucinate an image of a cow. So I'm gonna just show you a few clips from um, a TED talk by Blaise Aguirre Iacos, who is um, one of the central figures in Google and oversees the, uh, Google's group, the Artist Machine Intelligence Group, where they've been kind of investing in the applications of AI to, um, to the visual arts. So this is Blaze um, talking about um, how uh, a neural network recognizes an image of a bird. And I will read out the, um, I will read out the, 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 the text that um, uh, Blaise Aguirre Iacos um, says. There's a subtitle to each, to each talk. The basic task of perception is to take an image like this one and say, that's a bird. Which is a very simple thing for us to do with our brains. But you, you should all understand that for a computer, this was pretty much impossible just a few years ago. The classical computing paradigm is not one in which this task is easy to do. So what's going on between the pixels? Between the image of the bird and the word bird is essentially a set of neurons connected to each other in a neural network, as I'm diagramming here. This neural network could be biological inside our visual cortices. Or nowadays, we start to have the capability to model such neural networks on the computer. And I'll show you what, uh, what that actually looks like. So the pixels you can think about as a first layer of neurons. And that's in fact how it works in the eye. That's the neurons in the retina. And those feed forward into one layer after another layer after another layer of neurons, all connected by synapses of different weights. The behavior of this network is characterized by the strengths of all of those synapses. Those characterize the computational properties of this network. And at the end of the day, you have a, a, a neuron or a small group of neurons that light up saying bird. So that's in a way straightforward enough. Um, this is how what is called a convolutional neural net operates. It looks at an image and it eventually it interprets it like the image of the nail and it's fairly, it, Maybe it's 99% confident that it's a bird in this case. But what is truly fascinating, and this is something that I think that is really maybe the most important point that I'm gonna to say today, is that if you make it operate in the other direction, so instead of going from left to right, from right to left, you can start with the concept of bird and hallucinate an image of a bird. So this is um, uh, Blaise um, um, carrying on. About a year ago, Alex Morvinsurf in our team decided to experiment with what happens if we try solving for X. In other words, you know that it's a bird and you already have your neural network that you've trained on birds, but what is the picture of a bird? It turns out that by using exactly the same error minimization procedure, one can do that with the network trained to recognize birds. 
And the result turns out to be a picture of birds. Now that, to my mind, is truly astonishing. Um, what it begins to suggest is that the two modes of operation that we have in architectural culture, let's say, of interpretation, of theory, of recognizing something, is the opposite of the process of generation or creativity. And, and maybe that explains to some extent how most theorists are not necessarily the best designers and most designers are not necessarily the best theorists. Um, precisely because the way the brain works are two opposite modalities. Now they're always going to be combining each other in the sense that to be creative, you need to be critical, you need to have part of that sort of a, the other side. And to be a theorist, you've got to be cr creative. Um, but nonetheless, I, to my mind, this is an astonishing sort of insight. It shows you that maybe AI can help us to understand what human intelligence is. So this is the beginning of what's referred to as deep dream, a technique that's now become um, uh, widespread. Um, what deep, deep dream does, does is you train a, a neural network on a series of images. And rather than nails, this is clearly dogs and other strange creatures. And when it looks at something, when it, it, it scans something, it's, it's, it, it's generating something based on what it knows. So it will produce something that is based on the data set of dogs, producing this kind of weird hallucinatory um, image that is invariant to pose. The point about this is that in order for um, a neural network to be able to recognize something, it's got to know what something looks like in the first place, and you're drawing upon that to order, in order to generate an image, to synthesize an image. To my mind, that is astonishing in itself. But it goes further than that. So I want to just show um, the next step in terms of, 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 of uh, hallucination, how you can continually hallucinate. So this is Blaze again. Or well, Mike has done some other experiments in which he takes that cloud image, hallucinates, zooms, hallucinates, zooms, hallucinates. And in this way, we can get a sort of fugue state of the network, I suppose, or a sort of free association, in which the network is eating its own tail. So every image is now the basis for what do I see, what, what, what do I think I see next? What do I think I see next? What do I think I see next? I showed this for the first time in public to a group of, of, at a, a lecture in Seattle called Higher Education. This was right after marijuana was legalized. Laughter. <laughs> uh, Van Gogh, as it were, <laughs> interpretation of it. So Deep Dream had an amazing impact on the world of art, transforming it because suddenly we could realize, we realized that the computers could generate things. Maybe they weren't aware of what they were generating, but they could generate things. Um, the next step was um, what's called um, a GAN, a Generative Adversarial Network, that was developed um, uh, by Ian Goodfellow in 2014. And this takes us one step further. What happens is you basically, you train a neural network by playing two of them off against each other. So a Generative Adversarial Network is where you play off um, an artist or a generator, something that is hallucinating something, a deconvolutional net, and which in a way is op working the opposite way to a convolutional net, and you play that off against a convolutional net. So a convolutional net is interpreting um, it, it, it things. A critic or a, a discriminator, the other term has been used. And what's happening basically is the artist is throwing up a possibility of something, and the critic is telling, telling the artist whether or not it's convinced by it. And it's measuring against a data set of other images and until it's convinced by it, it's saying, no, no, I'm not good. It's a kind of, it eventually, it trains the, uh, the artist to produce something that is convincing. And then once you've got it trained, then you can get rid of the critic and you've got this kind of system. So in a way, this is also replicating the kind of system going on in architecture, whereby, as I mentioned before, 
designers have to have a certain criticism, a, crit a critical capacity about their work, but also theorists need to be, um, have a kind of creative ma imagination. Now, uh, GANs have, have spawned a whole series of different forms of, 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 of adversarial networks, creative adversarial networks, progressive GANs, style GANs, cycle GANs, archi GANs, there are many, many forms. There's a whole zoo of these different um, forms of GANs and it's revolutionized everything. Um, uh, and especially the world, uh, world of, of art and things. So this is an example of, of the early forms of GANs. And then what's been happening, of course, it's been getting more and more kind of improving over time. Um, so as you, when you get into the form of pro progressive GANs, you start getting all sorts of sophistication. You, start, you can generate these faces, or indeed, <coughs> in this case, there's a um, Airbnb um, interiors and things. And you can generate these things uh, with increasing accuracy the point that you would not believe that some of the images generated are being done by AI. They look so convincing. I was at a conference, an MIT conference in, in Austria a couple of years ago where someone was saying, I can always tell the difference. Um, no, you can't. No, you can't. Um, and so what's happening here, you're getting one source and you can see how it's playing one off. It's extracting features from one source and then putting onto another source. Um, and, and so on. And it's at this point where you get to style GANs that you think, holy shit, this is, this is, this is astonishing. So that comment about, you know, AI cannot produce images that do not already exist. This is precisely this. This is producing images, faces of people, hallucinating faces of people that do not exist. I'm completely thrown away by that. Thrown away by that. There is a site that you can go to called thispersondoesnotexist.com and each time you refresh your, your browser, you get a different face. You can see slight glitches in the top right here. You can see there's a clear there's imperfection. But the point about this is that GANs improve over time and eventually you get the point where it is absolutely, totally convincing. Um, style GANs improve upon progressive GANs by resolving the problem about entanglement that allows it to get more refined in terms of its features. And all of these faces, every single one of these faces has been generated by AI um, and very convincingly generated by AI. So now you can see the problem of deep fakes because AI is incredibly good at faking it, at producing someone's face that does not yet exist. Um, now that's had a huge impact on the world of art I should say the key question here is it's operating two dimensionally. Um, and from an architectural perspective, that's become the big issue. How do we use GANs in three dimensions? There are ways of doing it using um, Python, uh, PyTorch 3D, a new technique that's been developed and it's been explored at the University of Michigan. But on the whole, it is very difficult to work in 3D. This was another moment when um, a, a portrait produced by um, a, a group in Paris called Obvious, um, Edmond de Bellamy, the name of the portrait, was, was, was auctioned off at Sotheby's and actually attracted quite a high price. And the world of art has really been uh, transformed by this. Um, Mario Klingman produced The Butcher's Son, I it's called this painting, which won the Lumen Prize, the first time ever that an artwork um, had won an international prize. And actually the work is not bad. And, and it passes the Turing test. You would not have thought that this work was generated by AI. And yet it is, um, um, and so on. Also, architecturally, this is a version of Archigan, um, the work of Stanislas Chailu, a graduate of the Harvard GSD. Stanislav is actually now working for SpaceMaker AI, and I'll talk about them in a moment. Um, and we have actually a discussion between SpaceMaker and, and XCool um, at one of our talks coming up. Um, and Stanislav will himself be on. The, the, the panel discussion about AI that Matthias Del Campo is looking at. And what, what Archigans does is stack up different layers. And you start off with the plot of the site, then you have the floor plan itself of the building, and then you have the internal partitions, and then you have the furniture in it. And what's happening basically with this is it's, it's, uh, it's adapting to, to the kind of, um, the conditions and mutating and hallucinating a floor plan. Now I mentioned the fact that, that, that uh, AI doesn't work very well three-dimensionally, but actually architecturally, we work, well, we used to work anyway. When I was a student, you work completely two-dimensionally. Plan sections, elevations are two-dimensional things. So 
um, it is possible to use AI uh, for things like, like floor plans and so on. Now, I'll, I'll talk more about this maybe next week, um, uh, next, my next class. Um, this is Spacemaker AI. Um, and what's interesting is they're moving into um, the world of um, the architectural office. This is a, a startup in, um, uh, in, in, in Oslo, Norway, um, which was, uh, I think it was 2017, 2016, it was, it was started up and now has 100 employees. They have um, a number of different offices, including um, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, um, uh, where Stanislav himself is, is now based. Alongside that, um, uh, there's another company in Shenzhen. This is Wan Yu He, who is the CEO of, of a company called Xcool. The reason why it's called Xcool is that Wan Yu used to work for OMA. Xcool means X cool house, um, X rem cool house. But X cool also, according to the Urban Dictionary, means hyper cool. So it's a kind of play on those things. And what X cool's done is it's working through the cloud, and you can use your cell phone to access this. And uh, it's kind of it's been trained really on on developer architecture. So don't expect the architecture to be that, that, that astonishing. But for reasons I'll disclose next time, this is the game changer. Um, for all the amazing things that have been generated in schools of architecture. <coughs> This is the thing I think that is really going to transform architecture, the discipline and the profession of architecture um, in an astonishing way. This was actually the first building that was ever developed using some of these tools. Um, and uh, uh, this is what's happening right now. And I think one of the, the beautiful things about this whole event is being able to bring the world together, to bring Wen Yu from Shenzhen into a discussion um, with, uh, uh, Harvard Hoagland, Hoagland of, of um, or Space Maker AI, where they could exchange ideas. And even though they're operating at the opposite ends of the world in Shenzhen and, and Oslo, Norway, what was interesting is they had formed exactly the kind of the, the same, um, uh, same uh, position in terms of AI. They see it in terms of uh, an assistant, a kind of prosthetic assistance. They see it in terms of not AI, but uh, extended intelligence, where there's a kind of coupling of human and machine a kind of cyborg-like uh, condition, similar to the way that Andy Clark talks about, about how we operate as humans in terms of adapting and absorbing tools and becoming part of us. AI is now seen as an assistant, um, wow. rather than taking over, it's seen as an assistant. Anyway, these are the various sort of, the, uh, um, uh, the kind of work that they can do, testing out um, a, a building um, in, in terms of its, um, its performance. And, and, and this is, exactly what I was showing you in terms of the style GANs images. This is how you can use style GANs to hallucinate buildings. These buildings do not exist. In fact, for a while, Xcool had a website um, um, called this building does not exist. Exactly the same in some senses as this person does not exist. And you could generate, you could hallucinate these buildings in this way. To my mind, this is astonishing. This is a, a, a neural network that's been trained on a, a data set of, of modernist buildings and it's producing modernist buildings. Um, and they do not exist. Importantly though, these are actually two-dimensional images. They're not three-dimensional renderings. Um, they're not three-dimensional forms. And of course, you can see they're not perfect. There are kind of glitches. Um, uh, they're not totally convincing just yet, but take into account Moore's law, take into account the law of accelerating returns, and you know that it's going to be perfect fairly soon. Um, there's also um, something called Cool Plan, where you can manually work with this. It's, it's like a, um, an AI assistant that kind of like is, helps you in the drafting of things. But the kind of quality of the drawings, I mean, you would not know. These would pass the Turing test. You would think they were generated by, by humans. Now, I want to um, just move on to talk about uh, Refik Anadol. Now, one thing I forgot to mention at the beginning is actually right after this session, we have a session with Refik Anadol and a neuroscientist called Anil Seth, whose work I will mention later, which is kind of totally astonishing. So I hope that you can stay on um, and, and watch that. Um, Refik Anadol is a media artist from Turkey. Um, Turkey, for some reason, has produced a number of highly talented media artists, including Memo Acton, um, whose work I'll also show in a moment. And, and Refik uh, is, is not an architect, but he came to the, to the AA, to, to the, um, uh, to, came to LA to study at UCLA, um, and he's obsessed with architecture. The first thing he did when he landed from Istanbul, when his plane landed at LAX, he, he went straight to the Disney Hall, a, a building that he was completely 
fascinated by um, uh, and with which he ended up kind of uh, working on or one which one which he worked on now what is what Refik, although he's not an architect he uses buildings um, and images of buildings as his material and he projects onto buildings so buildings are both his material and also his canvas as it were this is a projection that was done with the help of google and ami to mark the 100th anniversary of the um, los angeles philharmonic um, orchestra and it was a projection of the material from the archives of um uh of the the, the la philharmonic onto the to frank frank gary's the frank gary's design designed uh, walt disney concert hall in la now refik will talk about this in a moment and it's worth listening to So um, Refik is uh, um, using a version of style gans to hallucinate on a building. The next step was really to take buildings themselves and to um, hallucinate uh, forms of buildings. So this is a, he started using style gans or a version of style gans and inputted a, a whole series of a data set of thousands and thousands of images. Um, of various architects, and this is a section on the work of Zaha Hadid. Um, now, I can't talk over this, which has been a bit unfortunate because I was planning to do this, but it'll take about two or three minutes, and I need to, you need to see this. Um, this is basically AI hallucinating buildings. These, this is it's just automatically happening. It's generating these, this, this kind of video, and it's done totally by AI. An AI trained um, uh, on images of Zaha Hadid architect build, building, architecture buildings. So I'm going to stop it at that point there. This is the image that we're using on the front cover of the book, of the two books. It's an image um, generated from a data set of Zaha Hadid architecture buildings, architectural buildings, but it's done by AI. Um, and it looks like Zaha. Um, I guess the interesting thing is that Zaha's office, while she was alive, there were 400 kind of mini Zaha's doing work for, for Zaha on behalf of the office. Um, 
but now she's dead, you could still technically produce something that looks like a Zaha design by using AI. Uh, this was maybe the best of them. There are a number of other images. This is clearly, I think anyone who's been to, to Galaxy Soho in Beijing will know that they must have used a lot of images from the Galaxy Soho um, build, of the building. Um, and of course, it can only produce images based on the, the data set on which it's been trained. Um, having said that, there are examples um, where um, you can, um, you can, one of the, one of the, the GANs is creative GANs, which introduces a kind of variation. So you're not limited by the data set. It actually allows you the possibility of doing something completely new. Um, Daniel Bolajan is one of my colleagues who set up Digital Futures World. Um, I should say there were three people who were completely instrumental in making this happen. Daniel Bolajan, uh, Biana Bogosian, and uh, Virginia Melnick. Um, and Daniel was responsible for automating the, um, the registration process. He's a complete genius. We had a few glitches with that and it didn't necessarily work totally well, but um, it nonetheless, I think it allowed us to, to do what we've done and to have so many workshops for Digital Futures World. And Daniel Bolajan is, um, he's from Ian Minko in Romania. Um, he uh, went on to study at Angavanta um, in Vienna um, and is now doing a PhD at Angavanta under Patrick Schumacher. He's also been working for Patrick with someone on some of the, um, the kind of simulations of behavioral possibilities in, in interior buildings that they've been, that, he's, that Patrick was showing in his work, um, in his lecture at the opening ceremony. And he's also been working with, um, uh, uh, with Wolf Pricks at uh, Corp Mugla. And uh, this is the kind of thing that he's produced, but there's going to be an entire lecture on this by Wolf Pricks, where he's going to talk about the journey from decon to AI. And this has been the kind of, the, I mean, Wolf, when he saw this, a kind of hallucinated buildings coming out of the um, computer, apparently was jumping around the office in, in, in ecstasy. This was what he's looking for, this the possibility of uh, using AI to generate buildings, um, and to open up all these kind of possibilities. Um, the way that Michael Hansmeier talks about this is how AI could become a muse. It can open up the range of possible forms beyond the kind of biases that we as humans have to generate any number of different sort of outcomes. Um, so this is a video of, um, uh, of walking through a journey, of walking through this, um, again, a building that does not actually exist. Anyway, um, and you'll get a chance to, say, to, to see more of that when, when Wolf gives his, his lecture. This is the work of Emmanuel Coe, who's also teaching on this uh, in one of the workshops on this uh, on digital features world. This is an example of the Bauhaus, where you look at other possible Bauhauses. Um, uh, in the center is the Bauhaus itself, but then it's generated a range of other possible outcomes. And I said, this is what, it, what AI is really good at, is, is opening up the range of possibilities beyond which humans have thought. Uh, I was always struck by, uh, uh, I was struck by a, a, a review at the AA when I was teaching there where one student came up with a proposal and said, I looked at the possibilities, there's six. And you think, why six? It's normally some kind of magical number, 10 or six or four or something. And the next student came up and said, listen, I've, I've looked at the possibilities, I've run them through the computer, there are 455 and to be honest, uh, 386 of them are really boring, but here they are. Um, so this is what AI can do. So um, I now want to come to what I think is the most interesting part of this. This is very recent work, recent ideas that I've been developing, the notion of hallucinating architecture. Now this feeds in exactly into the, the, the session that's gonna follow this one, um, where Anil Seth is going to be um, talking um, about hallucination and how human beings hallucinate. Anil Seth is a neuroscientist. Um, this St this uh, screen capture was taken a while back because it says he's only got 7 million views. He has almost got 10 million views for his TED talk. This is absolutely an amazing TED talk where he talks about how the brain itself is continually hallucinating and how our understanding of 
reality is a form of controlled hallucination. So this is a, a clip of, um, of Anil Seth talking about how we as humans are always already hallucinating. All this puts the brain basis of perception in a bit of a different light. Instead of perception depending largely on signals coming into the brain from the outside world, it depends as much, if not more, on perceptual predictions flowing in the opposite direction. We don't just passively perceive the world, we actively generate it. The world we experience comes as much, if not more, from the inside out as from the outside in. Let me give you one more example of perception as this active constructive process. Here we've combined immersive virtual reality with image processing to, sim to simulate the effects of overly strong perceptual predictions on experience. In this panoramic video, we've transformed the world, which in this case, which is in this case, Sussex campus, into a psychedelic playground. We've processed the footage using an algorithm based on Google's Deep Dream to simulate the effects of overly strong perceptual predictions. In this case, in this case to see dogs. And you can see this is a very strange thing. When perceptual predictions are too strong, as they are here, the result looks very much like the kinds of hallucinations people might report in altered states, or perhaps even in psychosis. Now, think about this for a minute. If hallucination is a kind of uncontrolled perception, then perception right here and right now is also a kind of hallucination, but a controlled hallucination in which the brain's predictions are being reined in. In fact, we're all hallucinating all the time, including right now. It's just that when we agree about our hallucinations, we call that reality. That, to my mind, is stunning. Um, our perception of reality is a controlled hallucination. Our perception of reality is a controlled hallucination. What I find interesting is how you can maybe uh, see parallels between the work of Slavoj Žižek. Um, Žižek, uh, as you know, I'm sure you all know, is a Lacanian uh, psychoanalytic thinker, a philosopher, um, who takes the position of, of Lacan that we don't actually engage with the real, with the real except in this moment of jouissance, what he calls jouissance, this bittersweet moment of aesthetic reflection and what we take for the real is actually a kind of representation of the real. And the way that he argues this, um, this is me in a, a roundtable discussion with Slavoj Žižek. I have to say this is the most terrifying thing to be in. Um, we had a round, the, other, the third person in the roundtable discussion was a convicted um, uh, murderer who actually had been um, part of the Bader Meinhof group and had gone to prison for 20 years um, and uh, had... Um, uh, had been reading Adorno and became a, a kind of self-taught uh, kind of cultural theorist while he was in prison. And being in a, in a warrant table discussion, I can tell you there's nothing more terrifying than a convicted murderer. Well, there's nothing more, there's only one thing more terrifying than being in a round table with a convicted murderer, and that is to be in, being in it with Slavoj Žižek, who is the most uh, astonishing individual. Um, I was very lucky in this discussion because I was given three questions and I knew Slavoj's standard answer to these things. Um, except he's so perverse. He is completely perverse. And uh, he, each time he said, I completely agree with you, but, and he argued exactly the opposite. Um, anyway, what I find interesting, and this, Anel Seth would never agree with this because he doesn't like psychoanalysis, but I'm continually seeing kind of reflections of um, how ideas from psychoanalysis are being, uh, born, are being kind of uh, corroborated in a sense by, neuro, by neuroscience. And the problem, of course, about psychoanalysis is that it's largely unproven. Freud surmises that we have an unconscious, but doesn't prove it, and so on, and so on. Anyway, one of the things that, uh, that Zizek talks about is actually how our understanding of the world comes to us through the lens of fantasy. 
fantasy is constitutive of what we call reality. It comes, to, reality comes to us through the maze of the imagination. In other words, we don't access it directly. It comes to us, we're filtered in a way. And it's filtered, I want to argue, by the way in which we've been trained. The ultimate lesson of virtual reality is the virtualization of the very true reality. In other words, what virtual reality teaches us is not how virtual virtual reality is, but how virtual reality itself is. Um, I, I've, I've uh, handed Chow, uh, who is a, a, um, the, the, an art, this article that, uh, that, that I reprinted in Designing for Digital World, I think one of the most interesting articles by, um, on architecture by anyone. Um, what well, it's about virtual reality, as, as it says, but, but super interesting. So what was interesting about, um, about Anil Seth is the way he continued, what is interesting about him, how he continually refers to our understanding of the world as a constructed reality. It's constructed, we are trained to see the world in a certain way. Ask a kid to draw a rainbow and they'll draw something like this. Um, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. Because we are trained at school to think about a rainbow in that way. In fact, a rainbow is made of a continual spectrum of colors. There, is, there are no seven, they're not seven colors, an infinite number of colors in a rainbow. But we've been taught at school, we've been trained, and what I want to say, we've been trained like AI, we've been trained to see seven colors there. And the same goes in a sense in architecture, we're trained that a functionalist building is something on Pilotti with a flat roof. Um, anybody who, who, who's been to the UK, where I come from, knows that flat roofs are not functional. They, they leak. Um, now here is something which I think is truly astonishing. This is the work of Memo Acton, uh, a media artist also from Turkey. And this is where he's, uh, he's showing us how we're trained to see things in a way very similar to how AI has been trained to see things. So just as in Deep Dream, which was trained on, 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 as we saw on images of dogs, we will see whatever we've been trained on in the environment. So on the left-hand side, the screen, and I'll say nothing um, while, while it's been played, but on the left-hand side is going to be an image of everyday objects on a table. And on the right-hand side is going to be, this is the AI generating an image that changes depending on what it's been trained on. And, and, and this, to my mind, is astonishing. Above me. 
So it could be, could somebody mute that microphone, sorry. Um, could you mute, mute, could you mute your microphone, please? Um, so what, what that was showing, and, I, and it's, it's, a, it's a video, it's called Gloomy Sunday, Memo Actum, M-E-M-O-A-K-T-E-N, you can find it online. It was basically showing that actually we're trained very much like AI. We're trained to see the world in a certain sort of way. And this kind of echoes exactly what Anil Seth has been telling us. We see the world in, in we're guessing, but our brain's in a kind of locked into a, a bony skull. We can't see anything. All we get is these electrical impulses. And we're trying to guess what's out there based on what he calls pre um, uh, predict, pr predictive perception. We, we're sort of just guessing what's out there. And we only see things in terms of what we're trained on. So what you saw in that video was a series of clips where it was, uh, you had uh, things, items on a table were on the left-hand side and you know, cloths and things uh, were, were interpreted on the right-hand side through the lens of, of particular images. So the there'd been a different data set. There was fire, there was ocean, there, was, there were flowers and so on. That is how we see the world. In other words, we're trained to see the world in certain sort of ways. Now, that's fascinating, it's fascinating, but I wanna show you now an example of how we see that in architecture. This is the work of F Fernando Salcedo, who's here in the audience today. Congratulations, Fernando, this is a great project, where he does the same thing for architecture. He's taking two data sets. One of them is a, is a project by Zahadid Architects, um, a kind of research center, uh, and I think you might recognize it. And the other one is generic, modernist architecture from Miami. On the left-hand side, you can see Fernando's wardrobe and the wardrobe is inter being interpreted on the right-hand side into a version of building. So again, I'll keep quiet while, while this is being played.
that, that, that is astonishing. Fernandez's wardrobe, his tie turns into a tower block and so on. And it shows us exactly the kind of, the, the message is the same as Anil Seth, the same as, as Memo Acton, that we are trained to see in the world in a certain world, world in a certain way. The term that I've used for this is the term architecturalization. Um, and I first used it in a critique of, of the, the notion of the discrete, um, uh, an article that, I think that, that is being provided to you by Chow. But if you think about it, this is what architects do the whole time. This is the Sydney Opera House where Utsum was inspired by the billowing sails of yachts in the harbor. And that's what comes out. He kind of architecturalizes the, the sails in some senses. So it's almost like architect, as architects, we have a gaze whereby we look at things and it's not just forms, it's also concepts and we architecturalize those concepts. So Gilles Deleuze writes a book about the fold, which really has little to do with architectural forms, but architects think, okay, he's talking about fold, folding. So we get folding and architecture coming out of that. We get books like the, the Discrete, um, which I find deeply problematic, I have to say, where uh, Gilles Retzin looks at the concept such as the discrete and, and computation is discrete, but somehow that suddenly gets turned into an architectural form. Equally di disturbing, I think, is, is Mario Carpo's understanding of, of, of how, of big data. And he makes a distinction between the kind of the, the, the nerve surface kind of smoothed out forms of what he calls the first uh, digital turn with the second digital turn where there's so much data, it's kind of messy. And that leads him to somehow um, to, to look at a, a, the, the 3D printed chair um, on the right hand side uh, by Gilles Redson and to say that's an example of big data. I mean, what big data has to do with architectural forms is beyond me. I mean, uh, 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 big data is about information, not form. So what you get then is any, any number of terms that are used in architecture are themselves somehow architecturalized in the mind of the imagination and no more so than the world of deconstruction. Those of you who know um, anything about Derrida know that really um, he was concerned not with architectural forms, he was using architecture as a metaphor in the sense we, uh, we, are cons we have a constructed view of reality our understanding of the world as in the rainbow or the, or the, or the flat roof functionist building is a constructed view. We've been taught to understand that's how architecture should be. And his point was we have to dismantle all that. We have to dismantle all those presuppositions or the privileged hierarchies by which we understand the world. And what's been interesting in some ways is that how, how Derrida and AI seem to kind of overlap in a certain moment now because we're discovering that uh, through AI that we, we have got a constructed way of how we look at the world. Equally, the kind of biases we find in AI, which is the main critique, one of the main critiques about AI, we have another way that we look at the world. We privilege certain terms over another in terms of these binary oppositions. We tend to privilege male over female and uh, uh, practice over theory and so on and so on. How is that different in a way to the terms that are used um, in AI? So. Finally, let me just kind of round things up. Um, what I think interesting then about this whole debate really is uh, how we can see AI as a mirror in which to understand certain aspects of how we as human beings see the world. And of course, there are many echoes that are going on in Blade Run itself where we see a kind of, uh, this was 82, right? Before Gary Kasparov had, beaten, had been beaten by, by Deep Blue. Um, I always find this interesting, this, uh, the, 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 the Volkampf test, which is so similar in a way um, to the Turing test. Is this somebody that we think is a, a, a human being? And of course, the whole notion of GANs itself, of, tr of trying to produce something that, is, um, uh, that looks like it's kind of, it's, it's, it's real. The, 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 the replicants look like they're real human beings. This is, uh, I think, uh, uh, Rutger Howell, who play, plays Roy Batty. He tragically died um, last year. Um, but he makes this comment, in many ways, Blade Runner wasn't about the replicants, it was about what does it mean to be human? And this, in a sense, also echoes the thoughts of, of the uh, of a Japanese uh, roboticist, Hiroshi Ishiguro, where he comments the robot as a kind of mirror that reflects humanity, and by, treat, by creating intelligent robots, we can open up new opportunities to contemplate what it means to be human. That, to my mind, is the best AI itself. It shows us, in a way, it becomes a mirror into, in which to understand what it is to be human. And to my mind, also, it can open up questions about 
how we as architects see the world and how we architecturalize the world. So let me just give you a, a, a few seconds of this clip of, uh, again, going back to where we started um, and then we'll open up for um, questions from the panel. Okay, um, that, uh, for those who missed the beginning, um, was the, um, uh, was a, a, a use of cycle gans by Daniel Bolajan that was pairing up um, a walk through the forest with, uh, with images from the Sagara Familia and creating, hallucinating something um, highly novel. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen at this point. Um, and, uh, we have Sa Sanford has to go um, at 10 to. Um, so um, what we'll do today, it was slightly longer, um, but we'll have um, a panel discussion and the final class on, on the third, um, when Marika will be presenting um, a lecture, we'll have more time for more discussions um, and more questions from the audience. I, I'm not sure we'll have time today for questions for the audience, but please save your questions. I just want to say also one thing, and that is that, um, uh, that, uh, um, that uh, uh, this is recorded and all the um, the videos will be um, uh, will, will be uploaded and you can see it again so um, there's also be replayed again so if I could invite a child to um, I'm trying to unmute Sanford and to try to unmute Marika I, I don't, um, sorry child could you could you maybe um, and, and also Antoine I think I have unmuted. Yeah, welcome, Antra. Um So, um, I mean, that was a provocation. And what is interesting, I think, is the world of history and theory on the whole has been kind of largely negative about the use of computation. And, um, but to my mind, in some ways, the real potential here is to th use AI to th rethink what it is to be human. Um, and to open up all these kind of questions. I don't know, I, do, I'll, I will pass it on to my colleagues for some, some questions. Yeah, well, I think we're going to be very convergent from very different point of view because I, I have actually this same fundamental thing, namely that AI enables us to understand better what it means to be human, even if, as I say, we start from a very different point of view. I, I just wanted to ask, you two questions. The first is, how do you characterize hallucination? Uh, because you've used a lot that term, but that was not completely clear to me, you know, in what sense is the machine as hallucinating thing, uh, you know, is it really the same uh, comparable thing as humans hallucinating? Because hallucination usually is linked to a semantic of some kind. Uh, so that will, would be my first question. And then my second question is about intention. So can we ask the first the question? Is, is very often linked to the idea that there is an intention. Whereas what you've shown is in some ways something like, which would be more comparable to nature's spontaneity. So should we call it creativity or spontaneity? So that, that would be the first two questions that pops in my mind after this great presentation. You know, I'm always amazed at the, the number of things you're able to weave together. You know, two small questions, hallucination yeah, well, and then creativity versus spontaneity. The first one, I mean, first of all, I, I'm not so, um, I, I'm skeptical of the term hallucinations myself. I mean, I think what's interesting, and you'll find a discussion going on, um, right after this between Anil Seth and, um, uh, and, and Refik Anadol about the terms that are being used. I mean, he used the term dreaming and so on and consciousness. I don't think you have consciousness, okay? Uh, the term hallucination, I think, is particularly problematic because if you look at Oliver Sacks, um, 
his understanding of hallucination is more close to what we might call AR, augmented reality, where you, you're seeing a reality, then you're seeing a kind of phantom of something appearing in that reality. So I, I agree that the terms are very loose um, uh, and, and, and it, you can't necessarily com combine the two. Um, but at the same time, I think for the sake of kind of provocation that, that, it's, um, that there's something interesting and kind of happening there. Um, so I completely agree with you. It's, it's not really hallucination at all. Um, but, but nonetheless, there's, there, there, it's, it's a term of convenience that doesn't, I think when you bring things together, it's a bit like the term um, space, right? Henri Lefebvre talks about space, but as a French person, I'm sure uh, as um, a Sanford as, as a Canadian will know that uh, espace can't be translated directly into space. And, but beyond that, I think what Henri Lefebvre is talking about in terms of space is more about spatial practices and the, the very concrete notion that we have of space as architects which is to say is something almost like you were to fill a building with concrete and then take away the walls. Um, and that would be what we think about as space, a kind of negative uh, form. So, you know, I think when you, the terms themselves, they have different contexts. I mean, can you translate these terms from one domain to another? Probably not. The example I always like is uh, Walter Benjamin's notion of translation, where you can translate words, you can translate the word bread into French and you've got pan and you can translate it into German and you've got brot, but does a, I mean, the German bread is like this, you know, you can get this kind of like, like bricks, these black solid sort of chunks of things, very different to the kind of baguette, you know? And I think there is a kind of impossibility in the sense of translation anyway, between these different domains um, in the first place. But what was the, the intentionality and creativity, I mean, that to my mind, is, that's, a, that's a very interesting kind of question because, um, and I'm still tussling at the moment with a with moment. I mean, when we dream, for example, are we in control of that? Is that conscious? Or is that something that's just kind of appearing in our imagination? And is the, the, the role of consciousness to, to appraise it in a way that Melanie Mitchell says that you have to be aware of the, the quality of something that's been produced? Um, so I, I'm, I'm not sure when you're being creative, whether we're just not doing a latent search through like AI in a sense of possibilities um, and whether there is much intentionality there. I, I'm not sure what the answer to that is, to be honest, but um, in many ways, I think, and I don't want to necessarily make conclusions so much as ask questions, because I think this is what the interesting thing about AI is, it really forces us to ask questions about certain certain issues. Um, um, I'm not sure the answer. No, because the, what I had in mind is that in some ways, you know, without intention, AI is creative in the way we can say nature is creative. You know, it produces, right. it produces something new but yeah. is it a creation or is it you know a, a, in the human sense there, cer certainly there is some human input in many of your deep learning in so far that you know humans have gathered a sample from which the machine starts uh, etc but apart from that is ai not something that should be better thought in relation to uh, to nature or a natural process yeah, Which was I, I the think, question behind that. Yeah, no, I, I think what I wanted to distinguish. That's really a question. I have no certitude, to be honest. Yeah, no, I think I mean, there's a, there's a different thing between generation. I mean, that's the term that was kind of used. I was trying to use in the generation of an output um, as opposed to creation and the notion of design. I think increasingly now what we're getting anyway is a kind of shift in the way that we operate as architects, where you're using um, computation to generate possible outcomes. I wouldn't call them designs we create a kind of design space and then generate these outcomes. And then we, we then filter them through a certain way or we evaluate them often aesthetically, frankly. Um, and so it's a very different kind of world. We, we don't have design, we have outcomes. We don't have uh, uh, necessarily uh, creativity so much as generation and, and, and so on. It's a bit like photographs these days. So the old days you would set up one particular shot very carefully. Now you just take a burst of images, some sample images, and then you have a look at them and you select the one that you like, and then you edit it further and you kind of, uh, so um, I think these terminologies, I think they're absolutely, you're absolutely right. We need to kind of question them. The ones that we've received, we, they need to be called into question. Thank you. Sanford has to go in a moment. So maybe I can maybe see if Sanford has got some comments to make. Am I on? Am I got a live screen, a live, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, well, look, uh, yes, yeah, so I am a little stressed as I try to leave. First of all, uh, you know, I thought very wonderful talk. 
I don't want to waste too much time uh, telling you why, but I say it's so damn important that what you did was essentially to contextualize all of the historical references as you began, as you moved through, because in fact, the loss of context is precisely what the, what I noticed, for example, that AI is actually leveraging uh, massively in our human cognitive ecology, if I can say so. Uh, I find being in the classroom today incredibly stressful for that very reason, that one is always needing either to remind oneself of the need actually to provide semantic, historical, even existential context to every reference uh, and idea or risk uh, actually being uh, utterly and completely misunderstood or simply uh, failing to communicate uh, altogether. So with that said, uh, look, I've made a lot of notes. I have one, lots of things to go at. I would say that uh, I'd like to just address two things uh, that were the most recent uh, things that came up that were on my mind. First off was uh, uh, Antoine's dual uh, introduction, shall we say, of the two terms. One was uh, asking for, uh, say, a richer and more precise um, understanding of exactly what hallucination might mean in the way in which it's now being used, and his addition of the word spontaneity. Because in fact, they're already, they're actually, in fact, they could very well be understood as the same term. I would also like to I would like to say that word spontaneity cannot be used too often today as a uh, placeholder, if you like, uh, to and, and a corrective, shall we say, to these one-dimensional forms of thinking uh, that are taking place where terms even like hallucination, cognition, perception, uh, the senses, are uh, continually being used, but are really been so ghettoized and so routinized, if you like, in these incredibly narrow, uh, shall we say, uh, technical uh, definitions. Now, I know you guys are about to see this thing on Seth, uh, Anno Seth's presentation. I would like to say that the hallucination problem is actually a big one. It is not his idea. It's not original with him at all. There's a lot of people have been working on this in Italy and Germany. It is a uh, media term. It is a very, very um, poorly theorized term. I would say that Anil Seth, perhaps more than anyone else, has a less of an idea, a less of an understanding of what a hallucination is than almost anyone I've ever seen making a career out of it. Uh, what we really need to uh, understand is that uh, uh, the, the fundamental problem of AI, in a way, is uh, reading and, and, and leveraging the environment, that's to say, leveraging the information that is, if I may use Antoine's term here, spontaneously generated around us and producing, if you like, a kind of an effective engagement or even if a kind of in a dance, or integration, and that's the term I'd like to leave because I only have a couple of minutes, um, how we integrate ourselves with the environment and, frankly, how the environment subsequently integrates itself with the integrative, um, um, shall we say, actions uh, that we commit. Now, when I use that word, the integrative action, I want to deliberately invoke the great work of, uh, what's his name? Sherrington. Uh, what was uh, Sherrington's? Uh, never mind. Sherrington was the founder of modern uh, neurobiology, of neuroscience, of neurology. Um, and he identified in that very early work that he did in the early 20th century, the fundamental, and by the way, this has not changed uh, with a hundred years of neuroscience, it has not changed, the problem of cognition, the problem of information pickup, the problem of perception ultimately is integration. Now, integration is always a unique and creative and spontaneous act. To call it hallucination, frankly, is a, is a, a travesty. But I want to say this, because I'll pick this up. I'm pretty sure this is what I am going to be picking up. 
to understand exactly what's happening in a real hallucination. And there's an enormous amount of science around this now, whether you go in the direction of Carl Friston and the free energy hypothesis, the direction of the Bayesian brain people, which wouldn't be mine, but it would be probably one that it would interest uh, a lot of AI people because it's so techno, uh, techno technically friendly. But in the other areas where one is actually looking at, for example, the action of uh, especially neurochemicals and non-ordinary experiences and how they give experience, how they give the human an experience of what lies outside of, outside of the fake, and let's say we say false, the fallacy of a rational uh, environment. And it is really a big problem here because AI really does focus on that. And architects, of course, can easily fall, if you like, into the, uh, into the uh, ghetto, shall we say, in which the environment is continually formulated and reformulated, if you like, as fundamentally a dead one and one fundamentally lacking in spontaneity. So I'm going to say whether Antoine meant this or not, our problem is to engage and understand the spontaneous. And that is on a level that is ethical, political, but as well as uh, technological, cognitive, and so on and so forth. I don't know if that made any sense to anyone out there, but I would like to say that it allowed me to at least <laughs> mark out a kind of position that I found was already in the stuff that you presented today, Neil. And that's why I texted you and was so grateful for the way you did present it, because, you know, we've been through a lot of cheerleading uh, in the last 20 and 30 years. Uh, and I think that the problem of AI, just like the political problems that we're having now, and even the biological problems that we are facing now, uh, uh, very urgently in the world are basically, uh, they fall into the same type of category of the types of mistakes that we can make and we are trying to teach ourselves no longer to make. So I'll leave it at that um, as a way, hopefully, to clear a bit of a path for something that I, because uh, I, you know, I picked up notes and I have things that I want to talk about. And I'm feeling that since Antoine's going tomorrow, he may also wish to uh, make further comments on that, on that question. Thanks. Thanks, Salva. No, that was that was fabulous. Um, and this is this is why I love what you have to say. It's it's kind of this this extemporizing kind of uh, philosophizing which we need so much in architecture. No, in terms of the, I think the issue of context is absolutely the kind of key question. I am probably paraphrasing too much what um, uh, Anil was saying. In fact, I'm sure I am. Um, and in fact, he is quite particular himself in in in, in not kind of uh, putting things in one dimension. Um, uh, you know, I. I well, okay, so um, w uh, you'll hear, well, unfortunately you won't hear because you'll be here, but, but right after this we have the discussion with Daniel Seth and he's kind of, he's, he didn't really get into the discussion about why he thought that kind of uh, uh, psychoanalysis was not so convincing, but he was very particular to kind of, to say we have to understand these, all these different registers within the, the, the a more holistic kind of context. And certainly if we look at Antonio Damasio, for example, um, uh, the Strange Order of Things was a recent book, and Damasio is in some ways more conservative, um, but what's interesting about Damasio, he has a background in AI, and he's skeptical about AI because you're abstracting it from the kind of feedback mechanisms that you get from the human body itself. Um, and uh, the whole discourse of Damasio is about the body itself, and I think you're absolutely correct. You, you cannot decontextualize these kind of things, and I, I, I always think that context is, incredibly important in, in, in terms of, let's say, the meaning of something, you know, something might mean something in a different way. If I, if I were playing tennis against you and you, you took a shot at me and I took a shot and I couldn't get it, I might call you a bastard. I doesn't mean to say I, I think you're legitimate. It's just what you say on the tennis court. And I think, you know, to have a sense of the context um, is absolutely vital. And decontextualizing things in this way is itself a potentially very dangerous situation. So I, I absolutely totally agree with that. And I, I think we should be very, um, very careful about how um, we address AI and, and trying to think that it's in any way close to the human imagination. Um, uh, Wolf Pricks was, when I interviewed him, was quoting, I think there's a, there's a guy called uh, Singer, a, a neuroscientist. And, uh, well, that's, yeah, that's Wolf Singer. Uh, Wolf Singer, yeah. yeah. And, and, um, 
Sure. And he kind of talks about the difference between AI as being one dimensional, whereas the brain is multi dimensional. Um, but I, what I would say, though, is I think on the whole, the intervention of neuroscience is absolutely vital to an architectural context. And I think the kind of paradigm that we've, we've shifted, um, we've, we've, we've moved beyond in a way, the idea that there's this kind of hagiography of philosophers. I mean, the real problem about philosophy, I think, is, is, um, uh, as Stephen Hawking points out, it's failed to keep pace with, with science and technology. Uh, um, and, and I think it's important to maybe to try and think about how we can rephrase the kind of, the, or reframe the kind of architectural critique within the context of what we might call the cognitive sciences, less content of philosophy itself, but more the cognitive sciences, where we're thinking about AI and neuroscience and psychology and some versions of, of, of philosophy itself as a kind of new framework for rethinking uh, um, uh, and repositioning architectural theory. Um, so anyway, that, uh, I think we're going to have a discussion that's going to continue on about that, Sanford, that I always appreciate your comments. Um, super smart. I wish we could have Sanford Quintus at every single school of architecture. And I think the kind of banalization of certain things, um, especially in schools like the Barton at the moment, I'm just careful what I say here, they put people from Barton watching, but we've got to be careful. We don't go down that line of the discrete as though dis the discrete is a theory of architecture. I mean, it's simply a term that's been appropriated and borrowed um, and used just via stylist stylistic language. I I'm very skeptical of some of these developments that are happening at the moment. Um, maybe I could invite uh, Marika to uh, uh, to say something. Well, I, I don't know. I feel like um, I'm just kind of, I feel like I'm getting into the conversation and I'm enjoying listening, honestly, um, uh, um, more than I feel like I have something to contribute. I, maybe I would just make a couple of points. Um, and, and I I do so in, in preparation for what I imagine um, Antoine will be uh, discussing tomorrow, um, which is I think we need to be quite careful about making old distinctions between fields like philosophy on the one hand and neuroscience on the other, for example. Um, I also think that we need to be quite careful about clean distinctions between um, image making um, and the imagination because we understand the role that judgment and aesthetics play in the way that we shape and understand our world. And in fact, some of the things that you were talking about today, Neil, um, which were so intriguing, um, had to do with that point at which something spontaneous becomes something generative and becomes something creative um, and becomes a new way to imagine operating in the world according to standards that might deviate from our own um, problematic or limited ethics or biases. So I, I, I think it would be too easy for us to say, um, cat. <laughs> <laughs> I think it would be too easy for us to say that there are certain models, let's say philosophy, um, that are inadequate to the present moment um, and I don't know, you know, even when you said that, I was thinking about a conversation that you and I had yesterday where you were finding a way to uh, almost rehabilitate um, a philosopher who's very out of style right now, um, Derrida, uh, and bring him into the conversation and point out the way large tranches of thought um, uh, have been misunderstood or kind of too easily discarded uh, precisely because they were limited to one to, um, to a kind of a formal metaphor um, in our field. So in the same way, I guess I maybe would just be, um, I would push back on that a little bit. Yeah, actually one thing I, I want to throw out there is, I, you know, I, if I have a disappointment with the material in, in Rethinking Architecture, you know, I, and I, I, I think it's fabulous. I mean, I wish I had more female voices there, but, anyway, um, but I mean, it's, it's, I think there's a one problem about philosophers and they, they even from even you could, from that point of view, put together very conservative people like Heidegger, and I, I really think we should forget Heidegger, that's one of my books, right? Um, alongside others, um, uh, like Baudrillard, for example. You know, in a way, there seems to be a, a lament going on in much of this discourse about things not being what they were like in the past, you know, and uh, therefore you can critique it. But that's because you know the past, and it's easy to judge it by the past. And, one of the philosophers that I, I really like is uh, Jean-François Lietard, and not that I'm an expert in his work, but as I understand, he has this idea of judging, 
and judging not by some fixed kind of standards, but by an ever evolving kind of framework, but you have to judge. Um, and some people have thought that's been relativistic. I think that, that Heidegger is more relativist in that sense, that he's, um, uh, there's a little, there's not that critical edge to what he's going on about. But I think the idea of somehow being open to the possibility of seeing that the world evolving in a new way and therefore evolving in a new context um, and the kind of thought processes that we need to have, which have got to also be changing. And it's like, we have to judge, of course, we have to judge, but we have to judge with an ever shifting kind of paradigm and in order to understand the present, I think we have to lose that slightly nostalgic um, uh, worldview that I think was too dominant in the kind of material in rethinking architecture was to say, we're judging according to what we already know. Um, and how do you kind of have the bravery to judge it um, within a context of a world that is changing forever? So to my mind, Leotard- well, that, is, that is precisely the, that's the, that's maybe one of the basic values of aesthetic judgment, right? Is that Aesthetic judgment is the point at which we are able to evaluate the world as we see it becoming, rather than necessarily having to rely on the programming, if I can put it that way, of what we already know. So, you know, that's the, that's the point where, it become, where image making in architecture becomes a kind of strange thing. Um, because, uh, and, and you talked about this, I think this is super interesting. Um, the fact that we, we've gotten really good at producing 2D images using AI, but we're not very good at all at producing sort of 3D designs. And so then there's a whole process of, of um, judgment that has to be applied and, and techniques that have to be kind of fed in to try to turn, you know, an approximation of something that looks maybe a little bit like Zaha Hadid in a kind of blurry snow globe um, uh, can, can, uh, can uh, produce something architectural. And, and, you know, I, I, I think the, the, um, the, the trick for us disciplinarily is going to be figuring out how to leverage disciplinary expertise, which is always based on stuff we already knew, um, and the aesthetic imagination of being able to really appreciate um, fresh and completely alien modes of seeing. Yeah. I mean, just to, I would say one thing is I think that aesthetics is both the kind of the real, I mean, we have, I think that's what, architects are so good at is, is this visual imagination and things, but it's also a problem in many ways. And that is anyways, and the, the anesthetics of architecture was a, a critique of the aestheticization process. Uh, and that's where I kind of have problems with say the Kantian notion of aesthetic judgment is that you often rinse out the social, the political and the economic if you just fetishize the image. So, and I think that's still relevant. You know, I think it was a kind of critique of postmodernism. It's probably a critique of object-oriented ontology, triple O, and so on, that there's a danger that we, we rinse these things out, which is also in some ways a kind of a, a version of the architecturalization, the process that I was talking about earlier on. I think it's, it's still there and it's still problematic. At the same time, you know, I think that's the capacity that we have as architects and to very quickly evaluate things. So in some ways, if you see the moment anyway, I think, you know, the idea that the computer is generating this material, we could equally I mean, what, what humans are good at is a judging very quickly. I mean, you can taste a cocktail and immediately tell you whether you like it or not. You can look at an image and immediately say whether you can like it or not. And it's an incredibly powerful process. If you combine that with the kind of the generation of multiple options through, through, through AI, then you've got a very interesting kind of synergy. So it's both well, a good thing. I think this is going to be an interesting thing for us to, to talk about over the next week, because I'm not really sure that that is the same as the, the, the let's say, the aesthetico ethico to coin an ugly term judgment that Kant was talking about. So I'm not sure that the kind of instant consumption of an image or the appreciation of the taste of a cocktail is the same as um, a, the, the kind of aesthetic judgment that is connected to ethics. So maybe that would be something that we can talk about. You're probably right there. I, I'm not a Kant expert on Kant, but I, I think truth in painting has a lot of things that have kind of, that, that can be brought out as a critique of, of Kant. Um, we're in a situation where we timetable wise, we schedule wise, uh, uh, as soon as the clock goes to, to nine, to what is nine o'clock here in LA, we move on to the next thing. I just want to thank uh, 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 Antoine and, and uh, Marika and uh, Sanford. I mean, astonishing. I, I, I now know why I invited you. I think we're going to have a week of fantastic questions for those in the audience. Um, we haven't had time today, but we definitely will have in the future and certainly on the final day on the third, um, when, if I may, uh, Neil, I'll, I'm planning to be much shorter tomorrow, so there will be okay. time for questions yeah. and uh, even continuing 
these uh, fascinating conversations. So really Have looking you. forward it. Uh, to finish unpacking all that you've presented for the first day it would be very hard to follow you. But thank you so <laughs> no, I didn't know about that, but uh, I have to follow myself as well, right? Um, so, yeah, <laughs> that's, that's true. Thank you, so thank you, thank you also to the audience here. I'm sorry I haven't had a chance for questions, but you know, without you, without people signing up for this and, and being part of it, um, there's no conversation. But we'll make sure that we'll have that in the future. Thank you also, Chow, who's been helping to coordinate this um, uh, in the background. So thank you and. Um, uh, see you tomorrow, same time, and please stay on. Those of you who are on, um, uh, um, who are on the Zoom things, if you transfer to the um, the live streaming on the YouTube thing, that's on the website for Digital Futures World. We'll go straight on to the um, the discussion about AI and neuroscience, which feeds in perfectly into all this. Thank you so much for everybody, and uh, see you again tomorrow.